Hello, David. Uh, really excited to have you on the podcast. Um, glad to have you. Uh, welcome. Hey, Nikita. Good to be with you today. Thank you. Uh, I would want to um, um, put a, a small disclaimer. So we're uh, active uh, on LMAX uh, as, a, as, a, as a hedge fund, um, just, just to throw it in there. Uh, but um, maybe um, as we start this episode, I want to ask you a bit more about your background. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, get get started there? Uh, what, where were you born and uh, how you uh, how did you get into finance? Good question. I'd, I, I'd love to tell you that um, I had it mapped out from an early age, but uh, ending up in finance or capital markets isn't isn't like uh, wanting to be a fireman or a doctor or or a surgeon. But um, so I'll, I'll get there in a minute. But yeah, I was born and bred in Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland. So I lived there till I was 11. I think I was pretty fortunate. Um, so brought up in the 70s in Northern Ireland, which was a troubled time. I was fortunate that we moved to London uh, when I was 11. Uh, so I met this wondrous place called London that was much more eclectic, much more balanced um, than the environment I was brought up in. So there was my, there was my first stroke of luck. Um, and then, look, I was relatively numerate um, all throughout school. Uh, I chose to go to, to work rather than go to university. That was sort of financial, financially driven. So my version of a degree was to go and uh, do some accounting qualifications with Ernst & Young, as you probably know it now. So I started off as a boring accountant. Yes, that's me. Um, perhaps that's why even at LMAX Digital today and, and LMAX Group, we have risk management at our core because that's how I learned about capital markets. Look, it was no great, um, there was no great master plan that I, I wanted to, to be in capital markets or to be in fixed income or to be in derivatives or to be in foreign exchange or to be in crypto. It was simply having to earn a living. So you know, I went to work when I was 18. I worked at Ancient Young for a few years. I worked in a banking and audit uh, department. So there's a lot of uh, banks that are, don't exist anymore that I audited, but most of the big names as well. And I learned about structured products, about fixed income, about derivatives. And then uh, a job came up at a bank that's under duress at the moment, but back then it was pretty good, called uh, Credit Suisse. Uh, I joined a triple A rated derivatives arm of that called Credit Suisse Financial Products. So rolling up, giving you some timestamps on that. Uh, that was June, 1992. So I was 21 years of age when I joined Credit Suisse Financial Products. And then that slowly morphed, morphed into Credit Suisse First Boston. Again, look, you know, a, a bit of fortune, I suppose, in that I worked in the, the middle office. I did regulatory reporting, did Bank of England returns. Again, it was all about numeracy and it was all about adapting to new technologies. I mean, you folks, young fellows like you, Nikita, won't, uh, won't realize it, but um, my prowess was that I learned the early stages of Excel. And before that, there was a thing called Lotus 1, 2, 3. We had to use keystrokes, right, to do formulas. So our prowess, if you like, was we could add up numbers quickly, whereas people were still using calculators. To give you an idea, whenever we did risk reports and risk notes, we used to fax them around the globe. Yeah, faxes. No one even knows how to send those anymore. So good fortune. Because I was relatively numerate and pretty au fait with modern technology, which is laughable now if you think about it. But it was 30 years ago. Modern technology was basically being able to use a spreadsheet. Um, remember, you only had ever one screen. So you couldn't even have multi windows open. You'd have to go alt tab to switch between two screens, which was an advancement. And if you did alt tab too quickly, then the, the, the screen would freeze. So because of that, I ended up in the front office um, and probably hit the front office, the trading floor when I was 24 years of age. Again, I joined a fixed income emerging markets division, the 12th guy in there. Uh, didn't really completely understand what we we're doing, but it was structured products. It was the 90s. It was lending, lending money to places like South Korea, to Russia, to Brazil. So I'll stop in a minute, but basically this was huge exposure for me. So I spent six weeks at a time in Moscow, six weeks at a time in Sao Paulo in Brazil, six weeks at a time in Seoul, uh, more or less trying to, uh, if you like, implement risk controls, risk systems in these far-flung, territories. I remember 
we bought a bank in Brazil, Banca Garantia Inversiones. And I was sent down to, quote, unquote, integrate them into Credit Suisse systems. Bear in mind, at this stage, I was 26 years of age. So I don't really know uh, what I, how I was supposed to do that. But ultimately, it worked. And I ended up running the risk book for the whole of fixed income emerging markets. We had some great times um, through the 90s. Very exciting times, but again, I probably learned the best lesson that you can take forward today. You know, you're looking at what's happening in the crypto landscape. You know, we made over a billion dollars in 1997, mainly through the Asian debt crisis. Then in 1998, the Russian um, implosion at the time and default on GK GKOs, and the bank lost over a billion dollars that day. So literally, the business I've been involved in and enjoyed learning from. Um, sort of went, sort of disappeared overnight, um, and all my friends disappeared. You know, you turn up to work one day, and there's a queue of 200 taxis around the corner, and you wonder if one of them's for you. Um, again, I, I will talk about luck and good fortune a lot. I was fortunate. I suppose I knew where everything was, um, so I stayed on. But that's that's kind of um, how I started in capital markets. That's sort of me from zero to the age of 30. You know, I was, uh, you know. I guess two decades growing up and then one decade learning my trade at uh, Credit Suisse, Credit Suisse First Boston and within fixed income and derivatives. Uh, I, I guess like we're going to make a couple of parallels uh, between uh, crypto and your experience at Credit Suisse, especially, you know, the, the latter years, uh, how, you know, some of these things are getting built uh, on a bunch of excitement, everyone gets involved. And then uh, on from one day to another, some of these things just, uh, stop uh, being a thing and uh, stop existing um, yeah so I guess like uh, though that, that mindset of you know risk management living to fight another day I'm sure like uh, uh, there, there will be some uh, like some some lessons that that you learn there but I guess like uh, as, as uh, you spent uh, well nine years uh, at, at Credit Suisse yeah, you moved on you had a bunch of different jobs and eventually um, you you landed uh, at Almax uh, why did you decide to join the firm uh, and what the first few years uh, were like? Sometimes I get a bit a bit nervous about the people expect, so younger people like yourself and the key to expect this master plan. Um, and I suppose you could write a book and pretend it was all mapped out. It wasn't, right? Um, genuinely, I've just tried to learn every day and improve every day. Look, I go back to how I started. I like numbers. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I like numbers. They speak to me. I understand them. I make decisions based on numbers. So when I'm when I'm based with uh, something which is purely qualitative, I struggle with that. So just the same. It's just the way your your brain is wired. So that's probably why I've stayed in capital markets for thirty years, and I did step out of it. So if we look at the three chapters of my career, you know been working for well, actually sadly i've been working for 34 years now but roughly i told you about the, the early three or four years but the last three decades or sort of three chapters first chapter was learning about capital markets like genuinely learning everything you know what is a bid and offer what is a derivative you know what is a delta all of that type of stuff so a decade learning that within banking if i'm honest with you after that first decade you think you know everything I then left banking and discovered I knew not much because mostly everything was done for me. You know, when you sit in a large investment bank, there everyone else does everything from turning the lights on to hooking up your computer to connecting your servers uh, to getting your regulation and dealing with compliance. When you have to do it on your own, as you discover at Fasanara Nikita. It's tough. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of challenges. So I sort of thought, okay, I'm outside of, I'm outside of the kid gloves, if you like, of banking and and institutional capital markets. I want to know how to learn. I want to learn how to run a business. What does that look like? So rather than being a company with twenty thousand employees, go and join a company with a few hundred. So I did various jobs. Um, I moved to more into the brokerage space. I was excited by technology. So back then, if you if you think about it, we talked about the early 2000s. So like everyone else, I invested and lost in dot com. I set up my own dot com actually while I was still at Credit Suisse and then moved on to 
online trading platforms. Now, this is the start of the 2000s. That was, that was um, not at all what you'd imagine today. I mean, effectively, they were elaborate chat boxes. You said, I would like to buy one Vodafone, and there's a bloke on the other side of it saying, one Vodafone at yours, 100 at 104. That was really online trading. And then the development into like automatic order management system, and then into, oh, one click and deal. Actually, back then in the middle of it, I did actually develop the first ever mobile trading system on an old Nokia phone. You know the old Nokia phones, red and green buttons, so you could buy and sell. It was terrible, but Technically, you could scroll through 100 markets and you could buy or sell. So I did, uh, I did that. I went through various brokerages, built a couple of brokerages, uh, got involved in spread betting, CFDs, sold, uh, sold a couple of those. And then I decided I was a bit tired of that market. And again, I had this craving to run a business. So I went and became a chief executive um, in an online investor relations business. So completely left behind 16 years of of capital markets prowess, if you like, or expertise, and said, okay, let me go and run a business, which got nothing to do with capital markets. But again, at technology at the core, it was all about how do we get chairman and chief executive messages out to stakeholders in real time? Remember in those days, so we're talking the mid 2000s then, it was all the written message, occasionally a big TV recording, but you'd have to go to the conference room somewhere to see it. So now we had these things like live streaming, right? Remember when the internet used to buffer all the time? But if a chairman or a chief executive of a 50, 100 companies talking, it can't buffer. It can't go, oh, sorry, wait on, a, hang on a little minute. So we had clients, 40 of the 50, 100, eight of the world's top 10 banks. And it was literally just that, getting messages out to stakeholders. And those stakeholders could be miners in Africa, um, gold miners in, in Western Australia, it could be office workers in Indonesia, Malaysia, you know, Brazil. So that bit was interesting, but I've got to say, I did that for two years, uh, sort of turned this business around, uh, got it into profitability for the first time in, in eight years. But ultimately, I guess the numbers were calling back at me um, and I didn't have the buzz or the excitement that perhaps I see in capital markets. So I left that pretty confident then that I could run a business, but went off and did my own thing. Nikita did some strange things, set up an online gaming company, did deals with the likes of um, Kodak and Amazon and this type of thing, proper corporate games. You know, we, we built Space Invader games and things like that. Um, then I built a mobile trading platform within Facebook. Don't tell them it wasn't um, technically we had to learn FBML and all that good stuff and build it within it. So I just wanted to prove that it could be done. Then I built, I had this other mobile trading platform. So I was having fun. That was at the tail end of the, of the, the, the 2000, the noughties decade, having fun, getting a lot of things wrong, Nikita. So don't worry about it. Yeah. I, I, I tried and failed on a few things then. And then, the, the, then I got the knock on the door. Elmax, uh, Elmax Group knocked on my door at the start of 2011 and said, do you want to take a look at it? And, and actually, I said no, in that I thought, I, I thought I'd had enough of capital markets. But it was on my doorstep, and I knew the chairman, so I wandered, I wandered down the street, so to speak, and took a, took a look at this business that had been... I'd gone from spreadsheet to Main Street, if you like, or I'd gone from an idea to a physical building with real people in three to four years. But standard startup, you know, um, it had spent most of the money and wasn't doing much revenue. And that's I'll stop there and you can ask questions and um, but I can take you through the LMAX journey. So that that takes you through the sort of second decade, which was. Up to yep. 2011, the last decade is LMAX, which, of course, I'm happy to talk. I'm most proud of in my life, uh, my business life, and I'm happy to talk about them forever more. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. So uh, let's let's dive right in. So uh, you joined LMAX, and what happens then? So it's funny. We tell stories about it. It, it, was, it was a classic startup. It was backed by, you know, it had heavyweight investors, they probably had too much money, if I'm honest. It took them too long to launch it. And what I discovered was there was LMAX stood for London Multi-Asset Exchange. 
And the whole idea was that it disintermediated the retail trading market. So if you like, it might have been prescient, might have been ahead of its time. But they had sort of spent all the money. They had not completed their technology product. And they had a product that wasn't particularly competitive with the UK um, and European CFD and margin FX business. So, and they had a lot of the wrong, they had some good people, but a lot of the wrong people. So there you go. When I, when I, when I analyzed this, I was brought in. It was the best job I'll ever have, by the way, Nikita. I was an interim chief executive. So the problems weren't mine. It was a case of, is there something to, is there something to solve here? Um, so if you like, I was highly paid, hired gun. Take a look at that for six months, David, and, and see what to do. And actually, what I discovered was under the hood, but I had to look hard, that they had this motor vehicle that looked like a Fiat or a Skoda. No disrespect to Fiat or Skoda, but... Under the bonnet, when I lifted it up, there was a Ferrari engine waiting there, just completely underutilized. So I went back to the then shareholders and went, yeah, you know what? In a three-year time horizon, we can fix this, but it's not going to be the business you thought it was. So it's that old-fashioned pivot. So I said, look, you're targeting retail, you're targeting multi-asset, primarily equities. I said, we shouldn't do retail because there are, there are many people better than retail than you here and it costs a lot of marketing dollars. You shouldn't do equities because I can buy you any equity on the street for $5. As you now know, it's zero. So what we should do is we need to harness the power of this Ferrari engine, um, which, and we should target out the world's largest capital market, which is foreign exchange, trade $7 trillion a day, and we should target out institutions. And I just said to them, you know, we need three years to turn it around. Um, but it's completely different from what you set out for what you uh, thought it would be at the outset. And we did it. And I was, again, good fortune comes to mind, Nikita. You know, they said, okay, that's a plan. Off you go. So it was a tough few. To give you an idea, when people say, you know, is 2022 a tough year, David? It doesn't even rank on the top five tough years at Almax and doesn't rank in the top five years in my life. Not even close. I'll tell you what bad years looked like. You know, the, the, the year I took LMAX over in 2011, the first month, we lost $1.5 million. Um, and then I rolled forward a little bit. So I started on this three-year plan, and I bought the business. We did an MBO in 2013. But the month I bought the business with, not on my own, with nine other hardy souls who are still with me today, there we call them euphemistically the garage crew i.e if it, if it all goes wrong we go back to the garage and we just keep running lmax um the month we wrote checks and bought the company we lost eight hundred thousand dollars so in a way i'm going you know look at this is really good i used to lose 1.5 million dollars a month now i'm only losing 800 but if i had my time again i look back and go wow um we must have been crazy to be clear we had enough money in the bank to enough money in the bank to run for another 10 months at that run rate but we were completely um we were complete believers in what almax could become and our, our place in the market so if we just kept hitting our targets we would easily shoot through break even and create our business of real value so look that's what we did the next three years there's kind of sort of three or four chunks of lmax the first three years was just that battle the bottom of the hockey stick you're all very well aware of the j curves and we're right at the bottom of the hockey stick when we bought the company um fought the way through my plan was to get to break even in three years we got to break even within 18 months and then sort of the the rest is history after that if you like those first three years was proving the concept Right. Is there a place for speed, price, transparency? Is there a place for fairer markets within foreign exchange? Is there is there a place for a new central limit order book in foreign exchange? And if you like, perhaps a, a fairer way and a more transparent way of trading that product. So I think we proved it a little bit in the first three years. And then we had to build. So the next three years were all about building, building on that um proving that we could distribute it more globally so at, at the time in 2015 when you're around sort of break even we were very 
London centric. So what did we do? We set up matching engines in Tokyo. For the next three years, set up matching engines in Tokyo, set up matching engines in New York, built out sales forces there. Uh, and that's kind of what we were doing purely as, a, as an FX house until 2018. We were healthily profitable at that stage, a good business. And I sort of challenged everyone and said, you know, we're a good small business. How do we become a great big business? And we're not there yet, by the way, Nikita. We're still trying hard. I wake up every morning with a focus to see how we can become a great big business. But we just, you know, decided then that we have to widen our reach. We have to add new products. And a few of my well-known liquidity providers. So, you know, at LMAX, all the world's largest banks trade with us and most of the world's largest proprietary training firms. And a few of these proprietary training firms asked me in 2017, said, David, why don't you put a matching engine together? Why don't you build an exchange for this new thing called crypto? My initial response was, hey, I'm busy enough with foreign exchange and what do we know about crypto? But we got, we got around the table, eight or nine of us. We did a bit of research, worked out it was relatively trivial for us to do that, certainly for the most liquid products. Um, and we put together LMAX Digital in within six months. We went from field to fork. Again, we went from you know spreadsheet, spreadsheet to Main Street or Wall Street within six months, and we launched LMAX Digital. And that's why I smile wryly. We launched LMAX Digital at the start of 2018, which they told me then was a crypto winter. So well done, David. Um, again, you've just nailed your timing. So yeah, we launched LMAX Digital right into a crypto winter, but it turns out there was a need for it. It was an institutional only product and my liquidity providers and my largest clients wanted to match with like-minded participants. We did that. And to be honest with you, Nikita, you know, LMAX Digital was the fastest growing exchange, but not particularly relevant within LMAX Group. It was sort of between five and 10% of revenues, and but it was a nice little business. And we, we just kept growing um, the core FX business, the core uh, brokerage business, the core digital business. And then 2000 and 2021 happened where everyone everyone started to get involved in, in crypto. So suddenly LMAX Digital became 40% of our revenues. Um, we were the largest Bitcoin fiat venue bar one. Um, that listed one in the United States of America. We traded more Bitcoin than everyone else last year. Our, our biggest day in crypto was 6.6 .6 billion, and we averaged around 2 billion a day in crypto. But to put that in perspective, I averaged about 25 billion a day in foreign exchange. So crypto was never, has never been the core, but it's important to us. You know, last year it would have been, um, if I look at it properly, about 11% of our volumes, but 35 to 40% of our revenues. So that's kind of the growth and you get towards where we are now. Obviously, we did a corporate deal in 2021 where we sold 30% of the business um, at a valuation of a billion dollars. Um, you move into 2022, which has been a challenging year for everyone. But for me, for us, we have much longer time horizons. You know, our time horizon is always three to five years. Where can we get to? As I said to you earlier, Nikita, how do we get to be a great big business? Um, that's my goal. You know, I want to I want to I, I want to sit in my nursing home in my later years and be able to point at a building, the, the type of which I see out your window and say, yeah, yeah, we built that. There's some legacy and we added some value to the market. We added some value um, to market structure and we added some value to people's lives. You know, I, that's probably what I end up being most proud about in my life is that the people we develop, the talent we develop and um, the opportunities we create. Uh, and the lives, the, the lives that they build for themselves. So uh, that's me. I feel I always feel a bit shy talking about myself, but there you go. There's um, we've been talking, I guess, for nearly 20 minutes now. But there's the sort of three chapters of uh, how LMAX has arrived here and how I've arrived um, running LMAX today. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, re pretty exciting story. Uh, I guess, like, I, I want to uh, spend now a, a good. Well, uh, second half of the of the podcast, uh, just talking about more the current and perhaps uh, I'll, you know because twenty twenty one was such a crazy year for everyone. Uh, just kind of uh, what you've seen, um, what things you've seen uh, from your perspective. So as you said, um, Almax uh, is and uh, and and was uh, an institutional only exchange, and obviously um, we've seen you know the likes of Binance, you know, spinning out and. 
uh, in 2019 and in uh, in kind of a uh, few short years becoming the really the force of nature and uh, some of the uh, Chinese exchanges which which were actually you know predating Binance by a good number of years and had the user base and everything um, and you know still were like really huge um, and so um, LMAX obviously um, was a bit fewer in terms of the the depths of coins that you were offering and it was uh, mostly uh, the spot. Uh, but kind of as you were, you know, looking at some of these companies and uh, FTX was surely the, together with Coinbase, uh, perhaps were the highest flying. Uh, it felt like they were raising money like every few months doing these meme rounds that like, you know, uh, let's just raise uh, 420 million to just, you know, from 69 investors just for the sake of it. So as you were kind of witnessing all that, uh, what kind of uh, new conversations were having? Uh, were some of the those big guys uh, on the prop uh, side, they were already involved for a good number of years, but more kind of you know, big hedge funds were they starting to get involved? I guess like comprehensively, as you were witnessing all this uh, growth from 5% to 40% of the revenue, was it going too fast, uh, too soon? Uh, and what kind of was going through your head? Another good question, Nikita. Um, it's interesting, right? I think it's back to that longer term view again, Nikita. So we walked around the company in 2021, and of course, there was a lot of smiles. But, you know, the work had been done two or three years previous. It's really hard. And you'll know this, you know, the bigger the company gets and the more diverse you are and the more complex in terms of organization structure, the harder it is to make changes that affect revenues or bottom line, not even in the next week, but in the next quarter, actually in the next year. I mean, to be clear to you, I'm already working on 2024, right? So there's, if there's a timestamp here, guys, that's, that's 12 and a half months away, because more or less, there's not much I can do to affect what's going to happen in 2023. So that's been done. That work has been done in 2021 and 2022. So two years of planning. So in 2021, we reaped the benefit of a crypto bull run. To be clear, we always expected it. And I still expect it. I think that crypto and DeFi will be a larger proportion of traditional finance. Um, than it is today. I mean, the total value of crypto today is less than a trillion dollars now. But even when it was, even when it was at three trillion dollars, you've got to remember that the total assets um, in custody in traditional finance are hundreds of trillions, like 200, depending on whether you say under custody or management, 200 trillion to 400 trillion dollars. So it's really, really tiny. Um, my view is that it should grow to be at least 10% of traditional finance. Now, I can't time it. Lucky enough, no one's ever paid me for um, my views on whether an asset is going up or down, and more specifically, when it's going to go up or down. Um, thank goodness, because you can look at my personal um, dealing account to see that um, I should never be running that type of business, the type of business you run. But we sort of time it and say, we, try, we make good strategic decisions. If you like some strategic bets. So... Um, we gambled way back 10 years ago that foreign exchange would move in a certain direction, become more electronic, become more transparent. We gambled in 2017 and 2018 that crypto would become more relevant. I believe, as I sit here with you today at the tail end of 2022, that crypto is more relevant and will become more pervasive in capital markets. So I didn't get overly excited last year and I'm not overly... Um, dejected now with what we've seen. I look at my benchmark, and with apologies to the Ethereum evangelists out there, and again, I like all these computer science experiments. But if I look at Bitcoin as a benchmark, at the start of the pandemic in 2020, Bitcoin traded below 4,000. Call it roughly 3,600. It's now trading above 17,000, right? This is a very good performing asset. Um, in a, on a two-year time horizon. So the robustness and resilience of Bitcoin, Ethereum, from where they started and all the other assets, all of the other quality assets tells you this is here to stay. So my viewpoint on 2022, 
Um, 2021, 2022, look, I didn't get carried away with those um, valuations. And in fact, people might expect, Nikita, that I'd be celebrating the downfall of some of those people. I'm not at all. I, I literally think that LMAX Digital and LMAX Group is part of capital markets ecosystem. And I think LMAX Digital is part of the wider crypto ecosystem. You need good price discovery. You need the trust the technology and the trans transparency that comes from an institutional platform or foundation to create greater retail products. And I totally believe in uh, free market access. You know, I'm a free market libertarian. All I've ever done for the last 20 years is how, think, how do I get greater market access to moms and pops on the streets? You know, I go back to when I was sat in a bank, the information on my desk cost $1.5 million a year. What was that information? It was things like, you know, um, Bloomberg, Telerate in the days, Reuters, to show me the price of a bond of a stock. Trading it was impossible. I have to call up some, some guy in a three-piece suit smoking cigars, and he charged me 1% to buy a stock that I can just see on the back of the Financial Times. So everything in the last 20 years has been about how can that become easier how can that market access become easier uh, and if you look at crypto uh, and DeFi, how do we how do we improve the velocity of money how do we improve the efficiency of of capital how can people take more control of their finances be that and i'm it's much wider than crypto back in the day you trusted some faceless pension fund to run your pension for you now you have self-managed pension funds now you can be your own bank if you want to be that way nikita you know if you want to store your own coin you can store it you can be your own bank that isn't the same for everyone so look, i i think the i think the advent of blockchain technology and some fantastic computer science experiments um like bitcoin like ethereum like the layer one protocols and what's happening now with with um in the world of DeFi, i think they're fabulous and I just hope that we can assist in building that. And I want there to be good actors in retail. I want there to be some fabulous retail brokers. I want there to be household names. I want there to be people, places that the man in the street can trust. This year has been tough for everyone. There is a reputational contagion rather than a credit contagion, right? There is a feeling that because of what happened, in the Bahamas, what happened with Terra Luna earlier on this year, what happened with um, some of your peers in, in crypto hedge funds, what happened with some of the lending desks, all of a sudden it's like everyone who touches crypto is a bad actor. No, that's not the case. Um, um, it's not the case on this call. It's not the case either side of this phone. And, and what I say to people is people often point at regulators and say, oh, well, it's their fault. Look, all we have to do, it takes a while to create regulation. All we have to do, the good actors in the space, is utilize best practice, act as if regulated. And it's not one or the other. You know, you don't have to be crypto evangelist that thinks anonymous, decentralized, uh, trustless. Um, it has to be, it has to, if that means we have to all be unregulated and offshore. I don't believe that's the case. You can, you can hold those core to your being and you can operate properly and you can great, create great product um, for the wider market and provide that market access. So look, yes, a, a topsy-turvy 21 and 22 for LMAX Digital and LMAX Group, we remain as committed as ever. We cannot capture the whole market. I think squarely we will reside in institutional for for the time being. The adoption will be a bit slower on that segment. And I think confidence has been knocked out of the retail market, but it will come back. I talked to you again on this call about 2001 and the dot-com crash. Um, it, didn't meet, it didn't make the internet bad. Because pets.com failed, didn't make it bad. In fact, it was probably a genius idea. It's just now all done on Amazon. Amazon itself at the time traded as high as $111. And dot-com crash traded down to $7, but it was a good company. Um, good company with good ideals uh, and a good concept. The same will be true of blockchain. The same will be due to, 
uh, same will be true of of crypto. Good blockchain companies, good crypto companies that follow best practice, that have something unique, that harness the best of technology, um, will succeed. And I'm very, I'm, I'm as excited now as I, uh, as I've ever been that crypto will be more pervasive in the decade ahead of us. Well, um, you tackled the, the, the question from so many different angles and uh, threw in a, a lot of uh, very interesting insights. Uh, I guess like if, if I wanted to, to pick one, I would uh, just um, ask for your own view because uh, that, that's, um, you know, as a, as a CEO of an, of an exchange, you have uh, probably the best take on it. But uh, where, where do you think uh, will be the steady state in terms of market access? So um, what felt like uh, there were um so many different trade-offs to, to strike so you could go offshore and get a lot of liquidity or you can go onshore and get a lot of more transparency and security then uh, you can be you know um trading on that exchange because uh, fees are lower uh, trading on this exchange because maybe um a futures uh, market is more developed on that exchange because options are more liquid so it's kind of you had to really like you know choose probably a good you know six seven of them um it, and uh, you know being uh, active on those just to uh, make sure that the execution as well uh you can uh, I, I, I get access to all of the breadth of points and so on and so on um and so now obviously the trust is invalidated uh a lot of exchanges under a lot of scrutiny so what do you think is the steady state like um obviously binance was 80 percent of share market share is 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 quite uh quite a monopoly at the moment what do you think is going to settle to yeah it is, and certainly in retail land, I think there needs to be more choice in retail land. And by the way, no one should be, that's not to be critical of any uh, individual offering. Competition is good. You know, I go back to where I started and how we started LMAX. We entered the largest capital market in the world, $7 trillion a day, with two massive names, one in Chicago, one in London, owning the market. How can this little company in West London possibly challenge that? Well, we thought we could challenge it because we added something. We thought we added superior technology. We thought we added better price discovery. We thought we added, um, you know, we, we added all of that transparency and better liquidity. So I, I hope, I really hope that there's some onshore entities that set up in all segments, retail and institutional, to create greater choice. And when you have that competitive market, it ends up being better for the end consumer. You're quite right at the moment. There's, there would appear to be one place to go. Um, there, there is a chap like in, in the United States who's going to say, no, 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 there's more than one place. But it's true. And behind all of that, we're going to need a framework. We're going to need a, We're going to need some sort of regulatory framework. And that's not – crypto evangelists might criticize me for this. The point of regulation, the first point of regulation is protect consumers. Now, there's three real reasons to have regulation. Protect consumers, create financial stability, and harness innovation. They're not the police. They're not the security services. They normally let it thrive. But if I go back to the top, it would be nice if we did offer some consumer protection so they don't just lose all their money overnight because something happened offshore. Now, again, I go back to my core, Nikita. I'm a free market libertarian. I say that again. If you and I decide to send our money to Bermuda, Bahamas, Caymans, to an offshore fund, assuming it's all within the law, or an offshore broker, we are grown-ups. We, are, we understand the risks we're taking. We understand credit risk. We understand market risk. And if we lose our funds, we lose our funds. That's wholesale, that's institutional. I would think we need to offer a little bit more comfort to the man on the street. We want to provide market access to those people, but they don't do it for a living, right? Doctors, nurses, bus drivers, just normal people we have who work 40 hours a week that want to invest their money. We need to offer them some protection. And my suggestion to them is that they do that on shore. The problem is, and this is a very fair criticism today, where do they go? There's nothing onshore. If LMAX Digital decided to move into retail today, decided to move into perpetual swaps, 
um, decided to offer leverage. I couldn't do it. I'd be in breach of my regulation, my FCA regulation in the United Kingdom, uh, my digital regulation in Gibraltar. I couldn't do it. So you have to go offshore. And uh, um, we choose not to do that because that brings reputational risk. So it'd be nice if there was a framework in the United States of America, a framework uh, under ESMA in Europe, a framework in Asia Pacific, a framework in the United Kingdom, so that we can challenge these offshore entities. And by the way, then you just let you just let that competition go, right? Because ultimately, customers will find the best place to trade. But at the moment, there's not enough choice. So I think um, you can't stop crypto now. So enforcement and prohibition is not going to work. There are, I think it's 80 million, maybe 100 million Bitcoin wallets right now. You've got things like MetaMask with um, 30 million wallets. It's gone. Right. So we have to find a way of protecting consumers. And that's a fair thing. And we should all want to do that. Like tell people what the risks are. Tell them how much uh, how much they might lose. Always look at your downside, everyone. If anyone's watching this, please consider your downside first before you look at your upside. Then maybe Nikita, through that, we can create some financial stability. So, yeah, in my opinion, whether it's through regulation or just better auditing, financial stability, what challenged that this year in crypto? Well, anybody could, could issue a stable coin. Anyone. I could have done. And if I'd been on a podcast with you with 10 million users, then maybe everyone would buy one of those, one of those Mercer coins. Um, and then they, but they should rightly say, well, where is that Mercer coin now? I'd like to be able to point at a bank account and say, well, it's there. Or point at a Bitcoin and say it's there. Um, whatever the assets is. The, the assets that you've chosen to, to back it with. So create some stability so that a stable coin can't go from 100 to zero, which is what happened. And then the, the last bit is, um, and I think regulators need to be careful and the market needs to be careful. I do believe that a lot of these coins, 19,500 unregistered securities, Mr. Gensler calls them, a lot of these coins will fold and will go to zero. But there are some great ones there. And I'm not going to name them, right? I'm not going to name check them. But there are some fantastic computer science experiments. And yes, they're not perfect. And yes, some of them might fail. But this is how capital markets was grown. You know, I go back, I go back to my prehistoric days in banking. We wrote, we wrote equity derivative um, banking rules because we did the first equity basket option. And the regulators had never accounted for it before. So it's a case of working with them and saying, well, look, this is how you measure risk on it. And this is what the rule should be. So you look at some of the biggest exchanges in the world, some of the biggest derivative exchanges in the world. They're, that's innovation. That's traditional market finance. And that's financial markets innovation. Um, you know, back in when I started, derivatives were brand new. You know, back to my auditing days, a derivative contract, you can't see in the video, but it's probably about two centimeters thick was your average swap contract. Disastrous. And someone like me had to go and tick and make sure that it was the same. We used to write tickets, like with all this photocopy paper. So the trader would say, I buy 5 million at 114 from XYZ Bank. That had to go to five different departments in paper. Somebody input it wrong. And the other side input it wrong. It was a disaster. So what we have now, what we have is financial in, uh, terrific innovation and a real chance to har harness that innovation. I hope, I hope the events of the last quarter, the implosion in the Bahamas, don't make law enforcement or regulators try and prohibit this. They would be wrong to prohibit it. I think we move forward into 2023. I think you're going to see some frameworks. And I think you will see some good companies. So the ones who've chased regulation in the US, I think you'll see them come to the fore. I think you'll see institutional venues like LMAX Digital come back to the fore. So yes, you made a good point, a good criticism of us. Uh, we, only, we only list seven coins today. We list the most liquid assets. But we're doing work in the background so that anything that's, we already do Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, XRP, Solana, USDC. But we're going to add a lot of other ERC-20 contracts, for example, so that we can store it, we can list it. We're going to see if we can move into the derivative space, 
right? Try and um, sell some listed derivatives. So expand the, the product set here. And I think that's going to happen across the market and across all segments. So the steady state today is there's not enough choice and there's inherently some systemic risk because of that lack of uh, choice and the concentration in a few venues. Um, I think you're going to see that uh, become more diversified in the in the next 12 to 24 months. Makes total sense. Um, effectively, some of those you know credit risks uh, were not really priced in at the decision making process, um, especially by retailers. So they were just um, yeah just uh, coming in to do these venues without you know much due diligence. Uh, and as a, as an outsider, it's obviously like very difficult to to conduct any of this assessment. Even as an insider, it's difficult because uh, talking to these exchanges is notoriously difficult. Um, but yeah, I feel like um, now uh, with the example of FTX, it's just the bar is so much higher, uh, and eventually, um, yeah, good good products will prevail, and um, the customers will will find their home. Um, but I guess. Um, we're we're running out of time, so I, I would want to uh, wrap up with one one question. Uh, just before we started recording, you mentioned to me that uh, you had an exciting journey to to North Pole. Uh, wh wh why don't you double click on that? <laughs> yeah, look, we like to. I I think it's interesting when you look at it when you run a business these days. You have to be very considerate of other things around you. So um, we like to give back. So we have an ESG strategy. You know, we give back in various various ways to our own community, to um, some environmental concerns. And this one actually was for a, a, uh, a children's charity, a children's charity for less, less abled youngsters. And the core of it is rugby in the United Kingdom. So I trekked to the North Pole. I have a world record for the most northern game of rugby. We did that back in 2015. And look, it wasn't all just a, a charitable pursuit. I've always wanted to go to the North Pole. Bizarrely, I was in, I was entered to go to the North Pole um, way back in 2008 or something. And then the credit crunch happened and the company I was going with went bust. So I couldn't go to the North Pole. And that was just for my own good self. Then this opportunity arose to go and do some good, raise some money for charity, to trek to the magnetic North Pole and uh, do, do a crazy thing like play a game of rugby. So... I loved it. Um, it was an experience of a lifetime. I'd like to have more time so that I can do more of those things. My bucket list, I'd like to be at the top and bottom of the world, right? So, and I don't mean Everest. I mean, I'd like to, now I've been to the North Pole, I'd like to be at the South Pole, but I need some time. I need three or four weeks where, yeah, I haven't got customers like you uh, or employees around me um, needing, my, needing my time. So I need a good four to six weeks uh, to go and to go and prepare for that and trek there. So hopefully at some stage in this next decade, when uh, LMAX Digital and crypto is booming, I can uh, I can I can head off head off to the south and and and, and fulfill those goals. Sounds sounds like a great plan. Well, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, David, uh, for spending the time with me and uh, discussing some of the journey that, that you, you've been under and uh, some of the interesting recollection of stories and um, uh, discussing the current situation uh, in the world of crypto. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nikita. My advice to everyone is just keep going. <laughs>